your biological activity in the soil is so critical. It doesn't matter if, if you're just an, you know, an organic producer, um, if you're using conventional methods, um, it's still as valuable um, as any other type of operation. So we are excited about the two new products that we're gonna talk about today. Um, they are truly new to, to uh, this area and we're excited as Dakota's Best to be um, offering them uh, going forward. So with that, um, I'll start out, I think we're gonna have uh, Barry Johnson go first. Uh, Barry Johnson is with the Symborg company and they are, um, he's gonna spend some time talking about the, the features and benefits of the Blue End product. So Barry, why don't you go ahead and start? Okay. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks uh, to Dakota's Best Seed and then Beston um, for the opportunity to present a new biological approach that helps manage nitrogen as a limiting factor. Um, you know, nitrogen management within a production system is an agronomic, economic, and sustainability challenge. Um, what I'm going to share with you is a uh, If I can get this up, can y'all see that? Yeah, it's just gonna take a second. Okay, I'm trying to get it in presentation mode. So, uh, sorry for the slow. While Barry finishes getting this up and running, I will make a note that uh, just like all the Fridays on the Farms that we do, uh, we do record these events. That way, um, if you're not able to attend um, live, uh, you can always go back to YouTube, just search um, Organic Farm Team, and you'll see all the previous uh, Fridays on the Farm and some of the other material that we've recorded in the past. So, okay. and your blue, so blue end logo is up on the screen, Barry. Okay, sorry, sorry for that little uh, delay there. So uh, anyway, I'm here to talk about Blue Ann. Um, Blue Ann is a natural source of nitrogen. Um, it is a uh, exclusive and patented um, bacteria that Simborg discovered. Um, it is, it was actually named by Simborg. Its uh, genus is Methylbacterium and, and species is Symbioticum. And we chose this particular species because of its great nitrogen fixing capacity, its efficacy under precision farming conditions, and it's a proven effectiveness in all crops of agronomic interest. Um, because it is patented and it is exclusive to Symborg, we know exactly how, where, and why this works, and we can share this with you. Um, as everyone knows, the atmosphere is made up of approximately 78% nitrogen. It's in the form of N2 gas. Plants are not able to assimilate atmospheric nitrogen. So our two delivery mechanisms are through commercial fertilization and also manures organically, and as well as mineralization in the soil. So our, our approach commercially is to add nitrogen in some fashion or form. In the conventional sense, we have several options. We have anhydrous ammonia, urea, UAN, things of that nature. Um, in organic farming, we have, you know, basically manures or um, refined organic matter or organic uh, sourced um, uh, manures as well. So the two forms of nitrogen that a plant can actually take up is ammonium, which is NH4 plus, and nitrate. We like the ammonium form because it is a positively charged cation, so it can adhere to a, um, a cation exchange site and not uh, be leached through the soil. Um, also, as the ammonium is taken up into the plant, it can go directly into the amino acid synthesis process. Um, if ammonium does convert to nitrate, nitrate can easily be taken up just as uh, uh, well as ammonium. However, because it's negatively charged, it, we then have the ability to leach um, through the soil profile before the plant has the ability to use it. 
or in saturated conditions, um, we can uh, lose through denitrification or volatility. Uh, when nitrate is taken up by the plant, it does have to convert back into the ammonium form to go into the glutamine synthesis or amino acid synthesis process. So that does take a little bit more plant energy to convert back to that form. So blue in is a foliar applied bacteria. It enters the plants through the stomata of the leaves, penetrating to the interior of the photosynthetic cells. Um, it uh, has the ability to uh, um, establish itself in the areas of the cytoplasm closest to the chloroplast, where there are greater amounts of iron and molybdenum. So blue N has chromophores that have the property of reflecting light towards the chloroplast. They're pinkish in nature, so that allows photosynthesis, photosynthesis to be intensified. This also increases methanol production or methane gas and greater mobilization of iron and molybdenum. It's actually the methane, the byproduct or waste product of photosynthesis that is the source of energy for the bacteria. And iron and molybdenum are necessary elements for the fixation process as well. So again, we have atmospheric nitrogen in the form of N2 gas. We have the bacteria residing within the cells of the interior parts of the leaf. And there's the electron microscope picture of the pink methylotropes. And it's actually in the nitrogenase two complex that we use the cofactors of molybdenum and iron to associate hydrogen with atmospheric nitrogen creating ammonium. The ammonium then can directly go into the amino acid synthesis process very efficiently. So these are the two side-by-side -side ways of fertilizing. Basically what we're doing is we're bypassing all the limitations or restrictions of uptake in the soil. Um, we're, we're bypassing the uh, limitations of loss. Um, Everything that's taking place from the fixation standpoint regarding blue N is above ground in the leaves. And it is actually has no cost of energy to the plant, which is very important because the fixation process, um, the bacteria is fed by a byproduct of photosynthesis, methane gas. Um, it's a very efficient process. So you can kind of think of this as a constant and consistent foliar feeding mechanism that's working 24-7 in the plant for you. Um, the, the bacteria does translocate uh, throughout the plant. Um, as the plant grows, it will continue to inoculate new growth. It is rain fast, what I call rain fast, in, a, in approximately one hour. And then it does take about 14 to 21 days for it to fully inoculate the entire plant. Once it fully inoculates the plant, then it does continue to grow within the plant. So again, it's a constant, consistent flow of nitrogen on demand in the appropriate amount. So there is biological regulation to the delivery or the fixation process. If the plant requires nitrogen and it's not getting it from the soil, it will always take it up from the soil first. But if there's something complicating the true need of that plant, the bacteria will, will kick in and provide the nitrogen in the appropriate amount. It will never over deliver nitrogen to the plant. So that's why we can actually be effective in legumes as well, um, where we can compensate for the lack of rhizobia um, activity, um, not being able to keep up with the true needs of that legume plant. So again, it's a constant, consistent flow of nitrogen to the plant. Um, so we're increasing crop profitability. We have, we're energy savings because the plant translates into greater plant growth because there's no energy requirement for the fixation process. And we provide less nitrates and oxidative gases, obviously. So we boost yields, improving profitability. 
were effective. Um, we enhanced nitrogen fertilization efficiency, reducing the dependency on nitrogen uptake from the soil, and were sustainable. Um, we protect the environment of water from nitrogen pollution, such as volatilization, greenhouse gas emissions, or nitrate leaching. So really what we're, what we're doing with Blue In is fulfilling the 4R nutrient strategy of right rate, time, place, and source. Blue In is applied at five ounces per acre. It's a one-time application. So it's the right rate, the right time. It's a very fairly juvenile state of the crop. So it's easy to get through V4 to V8 in corn, V4 to V8 in soybeans, four to six leaf um, stage in uh, cereal grains, or a better way to say it, maybe mid tillering to early stem elongation. It's the right place, it's foliar applied. The nitrogen fixing bacteria works inside the leaf cells adjacent to the chloroplast. We're bypassing all the soil limitations of restricted uptake and losses. And we're the right source. We're 100% biological, OMRI certified, Washington State certified, CDFA certified. Um, when the plants and nests, the bacteria leaves as well, there's no residual left behind. So we complement a solutions-based farming approach. We are a true organic source of nitrogen for the organic farming practices. In conventional nitrogen, Blue In provides a solid agronomic approach through responsible optimization of nitrogen in the farmer's pursuit of maximum yield, enhancing nitrogen use efficiency. So last year we did uh, several hundred uh, evaluations across the Midwest and I'd like to share some of those with you. The first is corn. Um, this is a case study in Iowa where the uh, farmer had laid down a, approximately 150 units of foundational nitrogen and came back with 40 units of side dressing application. And then the, uh, the blue end effect was an eight bushel advantage, um, 218 bushels compared to 210. And then across several trials across the Midwest last year with on average, a pre plant or foundational nitrogen of 135 units followed by 45 units of side dress application. We had a seven and a half bushel increase, um, 179.1 on the control compared to 186.6 on the blue end. Organic trials last year. Um, this is a uh, central Iowa field um, that uh, the gentleman was obviously uh, striping two hybrids, but in between the blue lines is where the blue end was applied. Um, it is a little bit more chlorotic on either side of where the blue end application was made. There's advancement in uh, ear maturity in a, um, uh, during an observation. And then we kept observations um, through uh, field view uh, climate last year as well. This is a little bit better picture of that. Um, on, again, on each side of the, uh, of the blue lines, it's a little bit more chlorotic. Um, this was a case study in Missouri. This particular farmer had four fields of corn and one um, soybean field um, that he was growing for organic soybean seed. Um, this particular field had 210 units of hog manure down as a base, and we had a 13 bushel increase. And that actually is his average increase on all four fields that he applied blue into last year. It ranged anywhere from 10 bushels to the acre up to 30 bushels to the acre. And then 22 additional trials across the Midwest organic production. Um, the, the base nitrogen source again was approximately 210 pounds to the acre. And we had um, just under a seven bushel per acre increase in corn. Um, 141.2 compared to 134.3 on the control. We actually had two organic soybean trials last year as well, and both of those were successful uh, with an average increase of 6.4 bushels to the acre. Um, we had several conventional trials that were successful in soybeans as well, and the conventional side we were uh, 5.3 bushels per acre increase. So there's some other experiences here that I 
basically shows you how blue ink can actually provide nitrogen. This is actually a garden situation where there was no additional nitrogen applied. Um, so the control was just working off mineralization in the soil. And then obviously the blue end area had the blue end application to it. This was green beans. Um, the first pick was a 50% increase. Um, and then obviously you can see the second and third picks had significant increases as well. Kohlrabi, we had uh, just a better overall plant development and root system. Sweet corn, we had a 7.5% increase in sample weight versus the control. And this gentleman also uh, planted a new grapevine um, that season. And uh, where he sprayed the blue in, we had a 34% increase in yield. And both samples were the same bricks level. So this basically just shows blue end can work on any crop of agronomic interest. So in conclusion, I think blue end is the solution um, for increasing profitability in conventional agriculture. Um, because we're OMRI certified, we can be used in restricted and protected areas as well as, as, well as conservation program makers. And we can increase profitability with the organic farmer because we're a true source of nitrogen for the organic farmer. What we're doing there primarily is compensating for the variability of the source and the variability of the application method itself. <clears throat> so we're currently working on compatibility um, for conventional farming. We should have a, a small basis or a small foundational list here soon, um, sometime in April. Of, of some of the heavy hitters for post-emergent corn, soybean, and wheat um, applications. Um, we are suitable um, for all types of agriculture, obviously. Um, we do have the organic certifications, and we are a single application uh, per crop cycle at five ounces per acre. So with that, um, hopefully I've stimulated some questions. Thanks, Barry. I know probably the part that excites me most about the Blue End product is that, especially whether you're organic or a conventional producer, if you're utilizing a lot of manure as your um, nitrogen source, you know, it just kind of depends on the year. If your soil's dry, if it's too wet, if it's cold, if it's hot, we don't know exactly how much organic nitrogen is going to be re released from that manure uh, during that year. And to me, Blue Ann will provide a, a real nice uh, opportunity to make sure that maybe we have conditions that that manure, we can't get 60 or 70% of that manure, you know, nitrogen out of, that, out of that manure that year. Uh, Blue Ann is definitely gonna step in and help that plant to compensate for that lack of, of nitrogen. So. Yes, absolutely. We, we did several of our conventional um, trials last year um, where they were using, whether it was hog manure or pen pack cattle manure as the foundational source of nitrogen. And we had very, very good results with that. Um, again, you know, just as you pointed out, there's, there's restrictions of uptake and conversion throughout the year, you know, as the, you know, weather changes, it can be too dry, it can be too wet. You know, again, all those requirements are being bypassed. So, the plant still requires nitrogen that might not be able to be taken out through the root system, but you know the, the bacteria is living within that plant, providing that uh, nitrogen fixation that's necessary to maximize that particular um, plant's goals. And, and even if you're applying, you know, let's say in hydrous in the fall or urea or liquid nitrogen in the spring, we don't always know exactly how much, you know, we have a pretty good idea how much nitrogen will be available, but, you know, if we get a super wet spring, we have a lot of, of volatilization. I mean, there, there still can be a, a loss. And I saw one question pop up on the chat menu, and it's one that I've gotten questions on is, so if I use Blue N in my operation, and let's say I'm a conventional uh, grower using commercial herbicides and, and fertilizers, how much nitrogen in theory could I replace with blue end? Well, that's a good question. So this year, um, 
we're asking that just be applied over full nitrogen um, programs. What we found last year was even though farmers are doing a really good job of the four R's where they're trying to do split applications, use stabilizers, use different sources, we found out that nitrogen is still a limiting factor and there's, there's compensation points within that growing season that Blue End can actually provide an ROI for. We are going to look this year at nitrogen optimization studies through third party trials where we can maybe next year um, experiment or have a good recommendations relative to, you know, in a corn soybean rotation, so much foundational nitrogen down, um, corn on corn, so much foundational nitrogen down. And then we would have, uh, you know, a range of nitrogen substitution as a side dress. And that range would also provide us sufficient buffer capacity to still provide compensation for applied nitrogen that did not get to the plant. Um, so uh, we're gonna work on those. And, and we did some of those studies last year um, and we want to refine and I guess, reconfirm what we, what we think we saw. So, so this year we would just like it to be over the top of full nitrogen programs because in general there's sufficient compensation points um, throughout the season that should provide sufficient ROI. Great. A um, couple more questions that have come in. Um, first, the first one I saw was, can this be applied in furrow? No, this is a 100% foliar applied. Um, it's, it's very unique. Um, some other biologicals um, have an in furrow application. Um, what's unique about us is, you know, that we are OMRI certified in full accreditation for organic farming practices. And we're 100% above ground activity working inside the leaves. So it's a fully applied only at this point. Great, and, uh, and honestly, that's kind of how um, I put this meeting together today. Um, we'll have Brady talk here in a little bit and Brady's got a product that definitely is more, um, is absolutely designed to be in the furrow and helps uh, kind of from the, let's say from the, the soil line down where this product is probably much more like Barry said, a, a foliar, you know, soil line and above type product. Um, one question was, uh, would it have any benefit in forage crops, especially grasses? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the, uh, <clears throat> for, for cereal crops, um, like wheat, barley, oats, um, uh, we have nitrogen use efficiency improvements in all crops. The highest nitrogen efficiency use improvement from a percentage standpoint is in cereal grains. Um, so it has a tremendous application for guys that want to really um, are in pursuit of maximum yield on their cereal crops. Um, again, we're bypassing any limitations in the soil. Um, we're there to provide nitrogen on demand. Um, we also, albeit just it was one, we did apply it um, on third cutting alfalfa last year. Um, that was a newly established uh, stand. And we did increase over 20 acres um, about a half a ton of production. It was high quality alfalfa, but what we really increased was the RFQ value and we um, raised that by 48 points. Now, I'm not going out and suggesting that's gonna be the typical um, response that you're gonna get in alfalfa. It was a real response. Um, we think there's a lot of merit to it for um, legumes like alfalfa and obviously in soybeans, but uh, you know, there's a, there, there's tremendous opportunity for forage grasses, cereal grains, things of that nature. And then one more question right before, so we can get to Brady, give him ample time. Um, what if I added some Molly, uh, iron and carbon foliar, can I get an even better response? Um, that's a good question. Um, we would like to look at what the, uh, what the formulation of that mix is. We have tested some low carbon formulation products and, there, and there's no antagonism with those. Um, 
I don't, I don't anticipate iron and moly being an issue either. However, um, it's not a requirement. Um, we, we've never, we've never suggested or, or seen anything to my knowledge that adding more iron and, and molybdenum would uh, increase the efficiency of the bacteria. Um, but you know, if, the, if it's something that they use in their production system, you know, what we would like to do is take a look at it, see what the sources are, see what the rates are, and just make sure there's not, you know, any potential antagonism um, to the bacteria or, you know, anything that would uh, limit the, uh, the effectiveness of the nutritional as well. Great. All right. Um, Brady, if you want to go ahead and start pulling your slides up, I'll do a short intro intro. Um, the next product we're going to talk about today is the Mycomax product. Uh, this comes to us from New Age Farming, uh, which is owned and operated by Brady Kirch Navy. Um, you, you know, like I was talking about earlier, this is definitely a, a product that we want to get applied in furrow and definitely helps the crop from, from below the soil line. And so with that, I'm going to let Brady take over and um, discuss his product. Uh, can everybody see it and hear me? Can't see it yet, but I can hear okay. you. Okay, um, I'll wait a minute then because it takes a little bit to get on there. Well, let me know when it's on. Usually we see an icon or a message that you're sharing your screen. We might not see the image yet, but yeah, let me try it again. Make sure it'll pop up and give you all the options for which window you want to share. While we get that up, I'll, um, one thing I, I forgot to mention is the, the pack size is fairly convenient. Yep, it's starting to come up, Brady. Okay. Um, on the blue end, it comes in a packet which treats 10 acres, and they, they package uh, 10 of those packets in a case. So you'll treat um, 100 acres with a case. But uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Brady. Okay, we got it. Looks good. All right, well, what we do here is like uh, um, like you said there, Herb, is we deal with plant line or soil line and down, okay? So if you look at this first picture, uh, you can see the top soil there, the darker soil. That's where we start, okay? Um, what mycorrhiza does is it forms a symbiotic relationship just like the bacteria we were just talking about with our plants, okay? So this goes in furrow, the spores will go into the plant upon germination and basically blow up your root system. Now, if you look at this picture, I put this on here because there's a cactus on the right there. It could have mycorrhiza running under the soil all the way to the base of that mountain and back to the plant, bringing back water, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium, iron, boron, you name it. Everything that plant wants, that is what it does. It'll bring it back to the plant and it grows the life cycle of the plant. Okay, Mother Nature made this eons ago that's how plants survive. Nobody was out putting nitrogen down for them. This is how they've been surviving forever, okay? So it's not a new product. It's a new product because the technology is there that we can use it, okay? So let's look at what mycorrhiza does, okay? So here's your corn plant, right? Here's your feeder, right? Your secondary root. Those spores that are in the mycomax, and that's basically all you're buying is millions of spores and a little bit of silicate. Okay, so it's 100% organic. Uh, we've got the OCIA, uh, we got the EcoCert, it's in at Omri right now, should have that back within a couple of weeks. So it's fully organic, uh, nothing in it, um, but these spores go into the roots. Okay, these are endomycorrhizal. Okay, so they go into the roots and they start growing the small hairs out of the roots immediately. So this starts upon germination. Okay, so we're starting to throw some roots or hairs out. This is the tip of a root, okay? Look at all the hairs growing off of it. That's the mycorrhiza, okay? That's what it does and it continues to do that throughout the year. So what happens is as the mycorrhiza grows, well, it needs something to grow. Well, how does it grow? Well, mama plant up here sends down starches and sugars and carbons down to keep these guys growing. These guys send up whatever mom and plant's calling for. If it's phosphorus, they naturally unlock phosphorus. So you've got a calcium phosphate locked up, and we've got a ton of phosphorus locked up because we got no mycorrhiza in our soil to unlock it. Okay, so we can unlock that. We can unlock uh, potassium. We can bring in nitrogen right through the soil through amino acids and proteins. Okay, so that's what it's doing. So 
right now our soils are, are poorly degraded, a lot of them. And then we, we've got a lot of people that are kind of onto that. And I was just at the seminar this week and a lot of guys talked about the cover crops, uh, the no-till or limited till. I 100% agree with that because what they're trying to do is build their mycorrhizal levels, okay? Once you build your mycorrhizal levels and it could take 15, 20 years, we've been tilling for a hundred to get them back up there. Then your soil goes to work for you. It brings it naturally, okay? There's a ton of good nematodes and good protozoa and bacteria in your soil. They're down there to eat organic matter, okay? They eat the organic matter and they poop. Well, guess what? The missing link is this mycorrhiza going and finding the poop and bringing it to the plant, okay? Right now, we've just got a root down there with no mycorrhiza. You can see this black root coming in. So we're side dressing and we're wide dropping, trying to get it right next to that root because that root takes up one to 5% of the the total root capacity in your soil, you put mycorrhizae in there, now you're up to 30, 40, 50% of your, your soil capacity. You're bringing in natural, natural nutrients, whatever that plant calls for. Zinc, we know how important that is early in the stages. So that's what it does and that's what it's been made to do. Why do we not have any? Tillage, UV light kills mycorrhiza. Every time we till uh, for a hundred years, we've been killing it and I'm guilty too, I grew up farming. Uh, fallow, uh, there's no host root to connect to to reproduce itself. So there you go again, you're, you're basically going dormant and dying. Erosion, fumigation, some fungicides, 99% of the fungicides we use today, we can put them right with it. It has no effect on them whatsoever. Um, and hydrus is a bad one. Uh, fumigation, I've got guys that raise onions and potatoes. They, they use my product every year because they fumigate and basically kill their soil. Okay, compaction. Why do we have a compaction issue? The issue is we don't have the mycorrhiza there. Okay, mycorrhiza mushroom, basically. That's that's their genus. Um, so when we get mushrooms growing under our soil, naturally your soil is going to be spongier. Okay, they're going to go deeper. Their their psi on a mycorrhiza is a thousand. Your normal root is two fifty to three fifty. So you're going to go into places and break things up that you've never broke up before. Okay. So now I'm just gonna go through some trials all over the country here. We've been doing this 10 plus years. Uh, I send it down south every year to a lot of guys because if you, they can get away with half the irrigation and get the exact same yield, okay? That's huge, that's, that's money in the back pocket right there. So here's some beans. I'm gonna go through these rather quick so we can get to some questions, but you can see immediately that root system starts to blow up. Everything's just bigger and better. Uh, here's one we did, and you look at the total seeds on the three plants, that's a big difference. So if you look here in the middle of the screen, you can see everything on the right over there was treated. So I see this every year. Your plant, your, your beans, your peas, whatever you're planting, they stay greener longer because they're a healthier plant. Healthier plant, higher yield. It all goes together, okay? Kidney beans, same thing. Pinto beans, same thing. Uh, here's sunflowers. Look at the difference in the root system. So I've talked to some biologists that said, well, if you've got a bunch of mycorrhizae in your soil, your root system will actually be smaller because the mycorrhizae is doing all the work. I said, no, 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 no. It's actually the opposite. Your root system has to be so much bigger because it's got all these feeders feeding it. So it has to be bigger. It has to store the nutrients in the water. And when the plant calls for them, boom, they're there, they send them up. So automatically, you have a bigger root system. So here's oats, okay, same thing. Barley. Uh, here's your typical corn root, right? See that purplish on there? That's called fallow syndrome, okay? That plant, when it was younger, did not get enough phosphorus, okay? So there, you're, you're already robbing yourself yield from, you know, that plant might be only be four inches tall, okay? The reason for that is you don't have enough mycorrhizae in your soil to unlock the phosphorus that's already there and pull it back to the plant. Okay, now I've looked at some root system of guys that have been, you know, no-till cover cropping for 20, 30 years. Their roots look like um, this next one here. Oops. So now look at this root system. This is 30 inches away from the last one I just showed you. This one was treated with mycorrhiza. Look at that, it's, I mean, you look at that bottom part, that's that bright green, that plant is getting what it needs to have optimal yield and health, okay? And that's what it's all about. If we have healthier soil, we get healthier plants, we get higher yields, less fertilizer, okay? 
Guys, right now, they're not even side dressing and wide dropping if they're using this product with me. And you can look on my website, which is farmfungi.com. Go through the 220 or 2020 growing season on corn, which is in the media section, and just watch what it does. I, I took it basically from planting all the way to right before harvest. Anyway, look at the root ball on this. There's so much mycorrhiza intertwined in that root ball, you could pound that on the ground and it wasn't going anywhere. The one on the left, all the dirt just fell off because nothing was holding it, okay? These strains of mycorrhiza are gloma strains. Glomus means glue. That's the glue that holds our soil together, okay? Look at the difference in the cob. It was 20 around versus 16 around, okay? We found some that were 24 around in this plot, okay? And that's just by bringing in all the natural, natural stuff that's already in our soil. Here's another one. This was right in furrow with your startup fertilizer. Here's an example of the one on the left, okay? That's not treated. That's your roots, what we got right now in our, our soils. The one on the right is treated with mycorrhiza. Look at the feeder roots on that one on the right. That is where your NPK, boron, iron, you name it, that's where it comes from right there. Here was, a, I believe it was a 19 bushel difference. Uh, if you look at the top there, 221, uh, then go down to the, the fourth one down, same hybrid, uh, I don't know, three down. So it's 202, yeah, it's 19 bushel difference. Here's a tissue sample we did, and you can see it's showing it's bringing in more N, uh, P. It didn't bring any more uh, potassium, which tells me that plant was getting enough potassium with what we put down, uh, more magnesium. If you go over to iron, you look at how much more iron that brought in. Now, if anybody raises beans and has IDC issues, here's your answer, okay? You're not getting, you're having an iron deficiency because you don't have a root system to bring in your iron, okay? Here's a plot test we did. Uh, you can see everyone with the T over there, um, second, second column is treated. Um, and then you go way to the far right, you'll see it's the difference in bushels. But another thing I want you to look at is moisture. And I want you to look at weight, okay? Pretty much all of them, we had a higher test weight, we were lower moisture. The reason for that is you put the mycorrhiza on, your corn is basically on steroids. It grows faster. It will tassel a week sooner than stuff that's not treated. I see it every year. And that's, again, on that video on my website. Um, and you can look at the bushels. Now, what I tell everybody is don't put it on a fixed year hybrid, okay? The third one down over there in the way in the far right column, that was a fixed year. I got a three bushel difference. So it doesn't pay for itself. Put it on at least a semi-flex to a full flex year, okay? Then you're going to be getting that, you know, eight to 15 bushel bump. Drought tolerance. Everybody's been talking this year about drought and it's going to be a dry year and this and that, but nobody really knows. But it's a good protection right here. Look at the one on the right. Now, look how fast these grow. You look at the left over here, the bottom left, those little hairs grew across, colonized on these corn on the right side there, and they're blowing up their root system. So this will grow that fast. You think of a mushroom in your yard, the first time you see it, it's two inches around. Guess what? Next day you walk out, it's four inches around. Well, this is what it's doing, but it's underground. It's underneath you, okay? So that's what's feeding the plant. I talked about amino acids and proteins in the soil from, from all our good bacteria and, and stuff down there. Most of the soils I deal with nowadays are 95 to 98% bacteria. The fungi is gone, okay? Ward Laboratories, I'm working with them right now. We're gonna come out with a mycorrhizal fungi test to basically be able to test this because it's never been done. No, nobody really knows how, how to do it, but we're working with them. Anyway, this is the amino acids, the proteins being brought through the hyphae, which are the hairs that grow off your root, right into the center of your root and up to your plant, okay? Again, like Barry said, you're not gonna over nitrogen or over fun. There's no way it can because mama plant is talking to the root system and they're, they're feeding each other, okay? So if mama plants had enough nitrogen, she says, nope, send me up some uh, water or whatever it may be that she wants. Okay, so that's how they work together. Experimental studies have shown that the hyphae of the mycorrhiza can deliver 80% of your plant's pee. So how much pee do we have locked up down there that we can't get, or we're trying to get with a chelate or something like that? Probably a lot of it. Okay, I've got guys that have already cut their pee by 20 to 30% because they know their soil and their roots are getting it for them. 25% uh, and 10K. You know, zinc is important, okay? 60% uh, of the copper. 
So it's bringing in everything that plant is asking it to do. Okay, it protects your roots from root rot. It's also the natural killer of cyst nematode. Okay, here's the root rot. Now, cyst nematode, we have some issues up here in the North Dakotas. I don't know around everywhere else where everybody's from, but the reason we have that is again, our soils are so predominantly bacteria, okay? We don't have the fungi balance to balance your soil and make your soil healthy, okay? So if a cyst nematode comes and attacks the root system, the mycorrhiza will form little hangman nooses around that root or around that worm and they strangle it and kill it and use it as a food source because what they'll do inside those hangman nooses, they start growing hyphae inside that worm and eat the worm from the inside out. So that, that sounds pretty gross, but it's actually feeding your plant. So, I, I, and that won't kill good ones because the good ones do not attack the plant. Anything that attacks the plants, they will protect. Okay, weeds. Um, I know guys uh, up here that are organic have weed problems. Well, I'm not gonna tell you there's gonna be less weeds. Most of the weeds we have a problem with are non-mycorrhizal. Just like a sugar beet, a canola, mustard, um, you know, anything in the brassica family is non-mycorrhizal. It cannot physically take these spores and boost its root system. So what happens is most of our weeds are non-mycorrhizal as well. So your crop actually starves the weeds of the NPK and everything else that goes with it and moisture because you've got a great big root system down there that's working for you. Okay, so you, I was in this field, the bottom field, there's just as many weeds. They're just not big and robust. Okay, so they're easier to kill. Here's, here's a list and you can add a uh, Palmer amaranth to that and you can, uh, water hemp as well as a non-mycorrhizal. So a lot of them we have problems with are non-mycorrhizal. So we can, we can starve them out a little bit. Uh, soil health and structure, I told you about that. It's the gloma strains. You know, you look at a pocket gopher mound, it's that nice round marbly. That, that's the way our soil is supposed to look. Uh, you know, it's supposed to have oxygen in there and everything, um, but it, it, a lot of ours don't, put it that way. This is the main component to healthy soil. Again, like I said, that's the reason people's are cover cropping and no-tilling, okay, to build your fungi levels. I've just got a way to do it faster. So how to use it? Like uh, Herb had said, we put it in with our starter fertilizer and we go, easy, easy peasy, okay? On the bean end of it, most guys are running it right through a seed treater and treating the beans with it, okay? So those are your main two ways. I do have guys that have hooked up little 12 volt pumps and they'll, they'll spray it on as they're, they're taking their corn out of one box into another box or into the, into the planter. However, however you do it, get it on the seed or close to the seed so it can go to work immediately, okay? So look at everything it does. Improves drought tolerance, nutrient uptake, weed suppression, root disease, nematode control, um, improved soil structure, Fertilizer input costs go down. Like I said, guys are going away from the, the wide dropping and side dressing. And uh, most of all, improves your, your health and your yield of your plant. Um, another big one that, that we're touching here is carbon sequestration. I know that's a big word out there right now. Um, these are a key component for that because we're pushing carbon down in the ground that can stay there for 50 years. So this is what it is. It comes in a jug. That jug right there is about the size of a quart jar. Okay, in there is millions and millions of spores and that covers 80 acres, okay? So super simple to use. It's like a powdered sugar is what it looks like. Really, really fine powder. And you put it in with your starter fertilizer and go um, retreat the seed. So really that's, that's the short version of what I got. Normally I've got a slideshow that's about hundred pages long but I, I narrowed it down here. So we got time for some questions and whatnot. Thanks, Brady. Yeah. You know, probably the one of the biggest things to me about this product is there's not a, it, it's pretty hard to have a convenient way to handle uh, mycorrhizae. And this is definitely, like you said, you, you know, like on our planter, we do have um, liquid starter. We apply some fish and some different products from the Dam, Dram Corporation. And we're going to be able to add this right to that mix. And it's quick and easy. It's going to be applied right where it needs to be in the furrow of the plant. Another thing I want to I want to bring up here is the Mycomax itself is made up of eight different species, and like I said, millions and millions of spores. Um, not all mycorrhizae is created equal. 
Like uh, Mike Rise, a lot of times I'll see other companies, they, they go by propagules. <laughs> Propagule could be a root hair, it could be a piece of dust, it could be a piece of dirt, it could be a piece of sand, it's just a propagule. Our product is 100% certified um, spores only because that's the only ones that do the work. So make sure you know what you're looking at if you're looking at mycorrhiza because they're not all created equal. You know, I think Brady brings up a good point. Uh, one of the things, you know, I think today it's very overwhelming on all the different biologicals and different products that are offered to the, the farming industry itself. And so, uh, like we said last week at our, our Organic Farm Team Summit, um, our job, our goal at Dakota's Best is to help sort through some of those products. And really, we're going to try to promote only the products that have the, the true uh, economic value to your farm and will provide a solution for your farm. So uh, definitely Myco Max and, and the Blue End product are products that we feel will really help out on your operation. Um, on our own, my own personal operation, we're going to be using both of these products um, because I um, the win ratios that you're seeing from, from Barry's slides and Brady's slides is, is pretty phenomenal in the industry. Um, they they kind of become a no-brainer type input um, because they're, they're cost-effective and, and very effective, I should say. So, um, looks like we had a uh, testimonial actually come in on the chat. I used it last year and had a great result, 9.6 bushel better on dry land and as high as 18 bushel better on my irrigated. Um, I also use nano brown sugar in furrow, uh, helps keep the fungi, uh, help, helps the fungi get to work faster. Do you have an, any data that suggests sugar helps the fungi, Brady? Uh, you can look at a lot. I've done a lot of research on that. And yes, the sh any kind of sugar, whether it be a molasses or a brown sugar or anything like that, because what's going to happen is you're going to excite your microbes, which whether it be bacteria or the fungi, because what, like I said before, what the bacteria does, they go out and eat and they poop. The mycorrhiza brings the poop to the plant. So yes, there's definitely a benefit to adding something like that with it. While we're on that topic, I've worked with growers in the past that have used programs that incorporate sugar, especially on a foliar side. Yep. Um, and they had some other kind of biological based inputs in the mix as well. But at least from their experience and they're um, up in the sort of Moorhead, Eastern North Dakota area, um, they have very heavy clay soils. And so, yep. you know, when they got into a big wet spell, that fertility that was being generated through at least the program they were on that involved a great deal of sugar um, just wasn't effective enough for them. So right. do you see any big result changes in you know how this stuff performs if we get a lot of heavy rains or is that when it really kind of shines? Um, actually, it shines, um, which makes sense logically, in drier um, conditions. Put it that way. I have a, I've got, from where I live, about 10 miles, there's a big sand ridge uh, and it doesn't hold water, obviously, right? So up there, they use it religiously because you've got a root system that's so much bigger, they can get that water and, you know, tra trap some of that nitrogen that's being brought in by this rain. Now, in the heavy clay stuff where I'm at, where I live, um, if it's really, really wet, yeah, you're probably not going to see the 10, 15 bushel difference. You're probably going to see a six or eight, but you look at how much phosphorus have we unlocked and how much potassium everybody, you know, and how much healthier is my soil? Um, that, that's another whole key to this thing. You know, it's not just that yield right away. We, I've worked with guys for six, seven years now, and they've literally cut their fertilizer bill in half because their soil's working for them. So yeah, I can't control the weather. You know, you wanna see a big yield, get it on some lighter soil, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I'm curious too, because, you know, in some of your slides and I've seen all the research on this, you know, tillage is kind of the enemy yep. of mycorrhizal fungi. Do you, you know, ever see someone having to do, like, especially in an organic system, sometimes people have to cultivate yeah. uh, later into the season, you know, is there kind yep. of a big disadvantage there and should they- it, it, It's not so much a disadvantage that year, 
Now at the end of the year, your plant is harvested, right? So it's not calling for any more water or nutrients, whatever. And that's when they turn to this glue on its soil. And that's the glue that holds your soil together. So what I tell people, if you have to till, which I cannot get any farm around me not to till, okay? Because we're in the thick gumbo, right? I get it. And we need the heating units in the spring. Don't till as deep, okay? I've got guys now that have went from seven, eight inches, and that's where the mycorrhizal lives is the top seven, eight inches to only going down three inches or going with a quick tool to our pro till or a sulfur or something. Just don't go as deep because that leaves a pocket in there for your next year's plant to grow into. Okay. So I, I don't like tillage, but if you have to do it, I get it. I grew up farming, you know, um, just don't go as deep, leave some there. Awesome. Well, if there's any other questions from the audience, I'm uh, keeping an eye on that chat box. I just wanted to give a mention here too, um, while we've been on the topic of some of the soil health and biologicals and mycorrhizal fungi, um, we did kind of go over this topic in a little bit different way in a webinar we did on um, the benefits of using small grains in rotation. So I'd encourage folks to check out our YouTube page at Organic Farm Team. I'm gonna bring up a couple of slides here to wrap things up if there's no more questions. So just um, some contact information for Herb and myself. Um, feel free to reach out to us with any more questions about these products as well. Um, and also I just wanted to mention our webinar next week, or not next week, two weeks from now, uh, March 26th. We're gonna have a guest on there for kind of more of an open Q&A um, her name's Carolyn Lane. She's got decades of experience in the organic and specialty grain marketing world, um, both regionally as well as internationally. So bring your tough questions um, for her. And again, all these are recorded um, and on our YouTube page at Organic Farm Team. And we're also on Facebook, so you can keep track of us there as well. Well, thanks so much everybody for coming today uh, and feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Otherwise, hopefully we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, Matt. Thanks all. <laughs>